Uh, welcome, everybody. Today's session is prioritizing diversity, equity, inclusion, and access at your institution, case studies and methodology, which will be presented by Veronica Reyes Escudero and uh, Steve Hussman. And unfortunately, one of the presenters, um, Alex Perguri, was not able to be with us today. So um, Veronica and Steve will be uh, doing the session today. Uh, and uh, let's see. So Steve Hussman is, has been has been a practicing archivist for over 30 years, and he's currently employed as a librarian and a curator of biblical affairs collections and curator for the history of science collections in special collections department at the University of Arizona. He earned uh, MAs in both public history and library science and a BA in history from um, Wellington College in Ohio. And our other presenter, Veronica Reyes Escudero is the Catherine, Catherine B. Wilcock, head of special collections at the University of Arizona. She most recently served as a Borderlands curator and instruction curator for special collections. She works with donors, faculty, staff, and students across disciplines in using special collections material and engages the community through events that highlight the archive's rich holdings in the U.S. borderlands. Veronica was previously a subject specialist for English literature, French, and Italian. She has written and presented on a incorporating archives-based research into the curriculum, the intersection of special collections and the digital, digital humanities in the archives of the Mexican American liter archives of the Mexican American literary, literary authors. She recently co-authored a book, Latinos in Libraries, Museums and Archives, Cultural Competence in Action, an asset-based approach, uh, asset-based approach. Uh, she served as the chair of the Rare Books Manuscript Section of the ACRL and the ALA. And with that, I welcome Veronica as a first presenter. Okay, hey, well, uh, good, good afternoon, everybody. I think it's afternoon for all, um, all of us at this point. Um, it's 12 noon here um, in our, Tucson, Arizona. Uh, I just wanted to uh, first start by um, uh, wishing Alexis well, and I hope that we do her um, we do her uh, <laughs> we do her well today as well um, in her stead. Um, she had asked us to talk about prioritizing diversity, equity, and inclusion and in access at our institutions um, with some case studies kind of um, situation. She had been a, she had attended another conference, and it, it came out that it would be good for institutions to talk about this. So I will talk about um, some case studies, but I, I'm, I'm going to frame it in, in work that I've done up to this point um, before my time as administrator in special collections as the Catherine B. Willock head of special collections. Um, so if you'll bear with me, but I think it lays the foundation for work that has to be done in order to um, be successful, um, or at least try attempt at being successful at this work because it's so important. Um, so in order for us to prioritize, um, and I can't see my slides, so my apologies. Um, in order for us to, uh, to do prioritization and diversity, equity, and inclusion and, and access, I posit these requirements. One, that it's that we're deliberate um, in engaging at all levels, um, that you know, it requires laying foundations for sustainability. It requires cultural competency as an imperative to the work. It requires recognizing our own limitations or areas of growth. And it requires weaving new frameworks into the existing infrastructure. And so with these um, sets of uh, uh, requirements, so to speak, um, I try to organize my, 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 uh, my slides in that way. Um, uh, you'll have to forgive me. I, I wanted to say at the start that I am, uh, I just, you know, shattered my knee and I've just come back from medical leave. So 
I apologize if I'm a little bit disorganized. Um, I, I'm trying to be um, as, as organized as possible, but I'm surrounded by pillows at this point. This is why I have a background. I'm not inviting you to my home today because I just, I'm not in a good position. Um, so just with that said, you know, just so that we all, we all know where we are. I know that all of us are um, handling uh, quite a bit out there with the pandemic and returning back to work and, you know, dealing with multiple issues that you may or may not share. But I wanted to share that so that you understand where I'm at. Um, so one of the um, things that Alexis asked me to talk about is the, the partnership we have with Knowledge River. And so to me, this, this falls within this requirement that I'm trying to suggest is that, you know, it, it, we have to lay the foundation for, for long-term sustainability. Um, we started working with Knowledge River um, in 2004 or so. So it's been a long relationship and the relationship has um, evolved over that period of time. Um, with, you know, this is from their, their website, um, just to, to recognize what they're, um, what they're doing with the program, which is to specialize in educating um, information professionals who experience, who have experience with or committed to the information needs of the um, uh, BIPOC communities. Um, with this in, in mind, um, in order for us to do things that are long-term and sustainable, we have to really connect it to other work um, that we're doing, uh, whether it's strategic plans in the university, at the libraries, et cetera. In this case, um, I came into Special Collections in 2004, and I believe they'd had already a couple of rounds of the cohort of Knowledge River coming through as graduate assistants um, in Special Collections. But there wasn't really a program per se um, set. Um, so I observed for a couple of years um, just to see, you know, what this program was about because I wasn't, I wasn't really involved with, with the students at that point. Um, uh, essentially, you know, students were hired, and at that point, um, like I said, it, there wasn't a program. As I observed, um, I was part of the rare books manuscript section and our um, diversity charge has been one of, one of the goals of the profession anyway, has been to recruit members of these, um, of the uh, underrepresented rac racial and ethnic groups into the profession. So to recruit the, um, these uh, members into the, the special collections profession was important. It was important for me. Um, when I was first started in rare books manuscript section, there was a handful of people of color, to be honest, um, at least represented in the conferences. Uh, and then, and so as you can see from their website, again, the Knowledge River program very clearly states that in one of their streams, because they have streams for working in academic librarianship, public librarianship, health sciences librarianship, and then archives and special collections librarian. And so over time, um, once, I, once I started to, to, to see what the program could be, I started talking with the coordinators at the time, we've had multiple since, um, and we agreed on the stream and they make it very clear on their website that they will work with the university library special collection. So this, this, this gives us a real commitment. Um, the lead partners on, on our campus at the University of Arizona are special collections and the Center for Creative Photography along with other, other um, repositories. Um, uh, but anyhow, so it, so it was very clearly stated and that, that means that we then have a real commitment to the organization, um, not just in, in, in accepting the students, but also uh, funding. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, so again, you know, the, the goal of, of our partnership um, is to diversify the profession. Many former students who have gone through the program have um, a really, uh, have done very well for themselves. Um, we have Lisette, who's currently senior assistant librarian at California State University. Stephen Curley, who um, worked with the Tribal Historic Preservation Department at Harvard University. Um, and is currently director of digital archives at the National um, Native uh, American Boarding School um, Healing Coalition. George Apalaka, who um, is currently digital asset manager at the Smithsonian Institute, who previously worked as a fellow at Harvard University. 
um, Natalia Fernandez, who is interim director of special collections and archives research um, center is now currently a, a tenured associate professor and I could go on and on. Not all of, not all of our students uh, uh, stayed in special collections, but that's part of the program is for them to explore different graduate, graduate assistantships. Some of them end up in, in public librarianship, some end up in special librarianship and others in, in the general academic uh, librarianship and others. So they don't all stay, but they, they I believe that they go um, away with, with good skills. Um, we started, we, we included in the, in the program, um, uh, and sorry, let me, let me back up. I wanna talk about the commitment here. The, the Knowledge River program is largely funded with grant funding and IMLS has been um, gracious enough to grant them uh, many years. I don't exactly know where they are at this point. I believe they did receive another one, but they don't fund the actual graduate assistantships. Those come from the partners. So we in special collections, the university libraries really, not just special collections, um, committed to this from the very beginning. And so we were able to fund, um, I think at this point, I counted them about, I wanna say about 40 or so um, graduate assistants that we funded through the years. Um, and so, you know, it, it does, it does, you know, we wanna put our money where our mouth is, right? So. That is one thing that we did is we, we ensured that two of our um, uh, found foundation accounts actually fund these graduate assistantships. Um, part of the training and skill building is not just the archival aspect, but also the working aspect, the professional aspect. So we actually um, walked them through, and this wasn't done at the beginning, but once they started really building the program was to include in their training and skill building the, in, the interview process. So while the coordinator would select um, students that offered an interest in special collections and archives, we still interviewed them. We still had them build resumes and cover letters um, and then had them come in and interview them. And that way they actually went through that process of, of um, having that experience of interviewing. And then, you know, they come in and we do all kinds of all kinds of um, skill building and training, like um, particularly around arrangement and um, and description, um, along with other projects that they do over the years. Uh, mentoring and coaching as part of this. During the early recession in 2008, we did not do that because we did not have enough people. Um, we had four people at that point um, to do the real mentoring and coaching that was required. Um, after that, we we really started to to focus in on that because we knew that it was important. So they were, they had a job, but they weren't they weren't uh, we weren't able to provide that. You know, once we've we've grown now since about 2010, and now we do that very deliberately. And for more about the program, you can read the article we wrote or the uh, chapter we wrote for um, in the academic uh, library management case studies book that Elaine Westbrook um, was one of the editors for. One of the requirements that we have of our students is to write a blog, um, the archivist apprenticeship blog. Um, here's a student who's writing about the documented border. Um, this was important because we wanted to show our funders the benefit that they were providing. It also um, allowed for the students to go away with sort of a record of what their projects were. Um, and, and then just for fun so that we could actually learn, you know, how, what they were learning um, during the apprenticeship. Um, that we, you know, sent, sort of called um, their graduate assistantship. So that was important. Um, examples of other projects that they've worked on is they work on our community and family digitization and preservation days. They work in congressional collections on digital and physical exhibitions. Um, they, one of them piloted translations of our findings into Spanish. Um, and then of course they would prepare materials and provide metadata for digital collections as well as their processing work. Um, so again, it, the, the commitments that an institution must have is in training and mentoring. I think that's super important. Um, we have devoted librarians and archivists that recognize their students' interests and strengths. Um, and of course, the funding, as I mentioned before. Uh, the rewards, of course, are that they um, we contribute to the training uh, for a more diverse workforce for the future in our field specifically, but also just in general. Um, and then that uh, one great benefit is that we utilize the skills of students um, that are beneficial to, to, to special collections 
I see there Julian Etienne, who um, when we were first, when I when he was on, it, we were uh, attempting our first Omeka digital um, exhibitions. So with his prowess around technical abilities, I mean, he, he um, designed that one of the first exhibitions. Um, and then we see um, other students there doing the processing. The other piece that we um, required was that they would present at the end of the term. Um, so these are just some of our students who have done um, amazing work. Our more recent student, Elizabeth Garcia, I wanted to put, put her there because she's the one in the white t-shirt. Um, in this pandemic world, we still had our graduate assistants. Um, we just kept her safe in her own conference room. Um, and we used the whole library space in order to give them the opportunities that they needed to um, to have as graduate students in the information in the information profession. Um, so we didn't stop um, during our pandemic uh, world to um, try to provide them the, with these opportunities. Um, so that that ends the part of um, really working with our Knowledge River partner. I'm at 12.16, so I'm gonna attempt to continue on to the next part that Alexis asked me to talk about, which was on collection manage, uh, collection development, excuse me. Um, and you'll see that this isn't a straightforward discussion, um, I, but I do believe that it, it um, requires some, um, some work on our part um, to get to the point of, of really talking about collection development. So just laying the groundwork here is that um, I believe that DEA requires deliberate engagement at all levels, um, certainly within, uh, with working with the community. Um, and forgive me, but this is probably where I, I'll end up um, looking at my notes a bit more just because this is what um, came at the, toward the end. And like I said, I was on medical leave. So I was like, I was a little, I'm a little bit um, foggy, I guess I should say. Um, however, um, so I, here I have an example of Mr. Rafael de la Torre who um, donated a collection um, relevant to the Cristero movement in Mexico. Um, we, we were interviewing him just to find out more about what, what it was that drove him to donate the collection. Um, I won't try to play the clip because it doesn't seem to be working. Um, but I have the, the general trans translation here of what he said. Um, so, and I wanna point out what he said really in red, which is, yeah, some of us do this work, um, me as Borderlands curator, and I'll kind of tell you a little bit more about that, but that was my, my previous um, position. Um, and I can do the work and I can build relationships and um, believe have, I believe I have the cultural competency that was necessary to do that in working with many people, of course, not myself, but one of the main things that really um, I hear over, I heard over and over from our donors and our community members is that they saw the backing of the university, the backing of the institution. Um, so that, so while they appreciated my relationship, and of course, you know, you, you have this one-on-one -on -one relationship with individuals and that is important, um, I couldn't have done it without the university's backing. I couldn't look over my shoulder to make sure that, you know, if I was making commitments, um, that it was going to actually um, be able to be moved forward. Um, so he had, you know, the confidence in special collections. Um, and so, you know, so I will talk a little bit about collection development, but again, uh, framing it under some of the, the work that needs to be done. Um, because deliberate engagement at all levels is crucial. Um, we can't, like I said, we can't talk about collection development without acknowledging the work required when doing this work in, in this DEI space. Um, Vine Deloria, as you know, and Howard Zinn have made multiple calls to action uh, way back. Um, and then just several years ago, Mark Green and Randall Jimerson engaged in a discussion on the imperative of social justice for archivists, with Mark Green disagreeing with this method. As a special collections professional, particularly as, as my previous position as Borderlands curator, Randall Jimerson's statement resonated with me. We will be the better for having the widest possible diversity of documentary perspectives on our society. Mark Green also offers a historical perspective on these calls to action, and of course their discussion is about more, but simply put, 
It's the same call to action we've heard since the 1970s and earlier to engage in a broader range of cultural materials. Many of us have been doing just that, quietly urging and doing in the background. Along with this, I wanna talk a little bit about post-custodial theory, and maybe we can talk about that in the Q&A. Um, one of the many archival scholars have engaged on discussions of post-custodial theory. Gilly Allen asserts that a community-based approach to archival practice is characterized by centering the interests, needs, and well-being of a community, respecting and acknowledging that community records and materials are respected and understood in the context of their creation rather than being seen by mainstream institutions as collectibles, salvage projects, or tools for institutional diversification and shifting community dynamics, including honoring diverse interests, epistemologies, and demographics and emotions. Evans et al. used an Australian case study to posit that self-determination and autonomy of communities within the archive can in fact lead to recovery, redress, and accountability for those communities that have experienced trauma and or human rights abuses. I suggest that uh, we can take significant steps to this within our own academic institutions and that we are when we hire people with a cultural competence needed to do the work. Um, here there are, you know, of course there are challenges in documentation. Um, through my lens as uh, previously, again, Borderlands curator, my goal is certainly to was, was to provide the widest possible diversity of documentary perspectives on our society in order to diversify the historical record, to contextualize the difficulties we face, these are some of the challenges in dealing with acquiring documentation from, uh, from um, our undocument, underdocumented communities. Um, we have mistrust from uh, largely anglophonic institutions. Um, and you'll, you'll see later that I have a, an example of that. Um, and like any institutions, we, you know, we have conflicting priorities. Um, and then some of the grassroots natures of these, of these collections, uh, that meant that if there were records available, they tended to be dispersed among the membership from year to year. That was, you know, an example of NGOs is what I've, what I've seen. Um, the language skills are important on numerous occasions, families, in fact, all of those from Mexico and those in, on this side of the border commented on their appreciation of my fluency in Spanish. It is important to hone our language skills. It is more important than I, um, than I think we give it credit. I certainly took it for granted for quite a few years. Um, this goes along with cultural competency and we'll talk a little bit more about that if I have time. Um, mid late to 20th centuries are also still active although our, our elders are getting to the point where they need um, places to have their papers um, donated or deposited. Um, and then of course there are many lost archives when um, and for some reason families don't believe that their material is important. I'm trying to speed up here because I know we're running out of time. Um, but I do wanna spend a little bit of time on cultural competency. Um, and so why cultural competency uh, really, like I said on the slide is because our historical record depends on it. Future research depends on it, and certainly reframing historical and cultural, cultural nar narratives depend on it. So let's really think about this in the, in the context of the United States. Why are we talking about cultural competence? Um, well, as to maybe one of you know, uh, several years ago, I co-authored a book, Latinos in Libraries, Museums and Archives, Cultural Competence in Action, an acid-based approach. That was a very long title. Um, Anyway, I, at that time, uh, believe it or not, just what, five or so years ago, um, let, me, let me just say, I, I asked myself that question when we were starting to think about writing this book, um, particularly I think as an underrepresented library, library faculty, um, I had already received tenure, but I hadn't um, gone up to full yet. And so, but I thought, you know, well, why delve into this? Um, at that point, uh, lots of research and publications have come out since, um, different flavors, but the same idea and certainly some expansion on these ideas on the topic. Um, but I'd had um, then an occasion to talk on multiple venues about building authentic relationships with donors, with community members. And through my lens as Borderlands curator focused on the US-Mexico borderlands, I realized that cultural competency is an imperative and how we relate to donors and the community how we frame our work and how we reframe our institutional frameworks. It is how we work toward post-custodial practices. 
When we work in a country with historically, which historically has diminished certain immigrant groups and their contributions, reframing our institutional frameworks necessitates diligence, patience, and constant examination in order that changes are long-term and sustainable. When my colleagues and I began to discuss the writing about, about working with Latinos, I wasn't sure if I was ready to take on the task, but my professional work and service and frankly, my upbringing and my day-to-day -day life had led me to see the importance, the imperative to write about cultural competence in our field. For me, the opportunity was timely. Dr. Montiel overall had written on the topic of cultural competence and I had already presented widely on building relationships with individual donors from underrepresented communities. Our colleague Annabel Nunez had long worked as a health sciences librarian brokering relationships between community and colleagues in public health. I did not take a book to um, take on the writing of the book lightly. It was a substantial commitment for all of us. We would necessarily sacrifice evenings, early mornings, and for me, the only family day, um, a week with my then small children. And as an underrepresented faculty in my field, I wondered whether or not research on diversity and cultural competence would be taken seriously. And this was just four or five years ago. I don't think that would be true today. I'm sure there are uh, one or more studies on there uh, as to how research by minority faculty is discounted, especially when they research diversity. After many cafecitos to discuss our ideas and experiences, we decided the issues and the commitment to them was, was way too important. And if not us, then who? My mother would turn over in her grave if she knew her papers were going to the Yankees. One of my donors spoke these words as he considered donating his mother's papers with us. As a donor of Mexican descent, his words captured my fears and misgivings about donating his family's legacy to a US academic institution. Two years into our relationship, he was on a visit to our archive and I was demonstrating what we had to offer to, to preserve process and make his mother's invaluable papers accessible. We were standing by one of the stacks. I could see he was delighted by the future we offered for his mother's papers, preservation, organization, access, especially in light of their state in his home. But anxiety came over him as he contemplated the decision. What would it mean to him, to his extended family, to his mother's legacy, to deposit her papers in a place, an institution, and a nation representative of so deep a history of marginalization, even rejection? And I didn't just understand, I knew it too. So we're getting to the point of um, 1228 and I really want to go past um, 1230 so that um, Steve has time to give his talk and also to um, have uh, time for Q&A. Um, I'll just take a couple of minutes to see if there's something that um, I want to point out. I mean, there's lots to really have a discussion about. I think I'll leave it as, um, let me see. I think I'll leave it here. Uh, I'll just finish this slide. Um, in my now longest career as a librarian, 22 years, if I can, or more, I've immersed myself in several areas, including more than 15 years in the archival special collections field as librarian and Borderlands Curator for Special Collections at the University of Arizona Libraries. I've worked with many donors with misgivings, just like the one I mentioned before. Slowly, I began to realize I've, I brought assets and competencies into my work and, donor, and donors um, I was otherwise taking for granted, like my language skills. Special collections, librarians and archivists working with Latino and other communities face a variety of challenges in pursuit of collections. We heed the calls to diversify the historical record and work with underrepresented communities. We join our efforts to those of other institutions, yet we've hardly considered the skills necessary to work collaboratively within and with these communities. As my co-authors and I wrote in the book, we had long conversations about our respective clients, donors, and patrons. Most importantly, we recognized the importance of tacit knowledge. We began to tease out long ago learned behaviors and knowledge so deeply held it was second nature and hardly valued. It did not escape me that we were delving into what might be described perhaps diminished as soft skills. But I know now through our experience and the research, these competencies are essential, hard won, even painful insights to our communities. Trust and relationships with our underrepresented communities cannot be taken for granted. Research identity and the historical record depend 
on trust and relationships. And, I, and I'll end there. Um, thank you. Great, thanks, Veronica. Let's see, I'm gonna go ahead and go into share screen here. I think as, and as Veronica has pointed out, I also wanna send out uh, my prayers and thoughts for Alexis Paraguay, uh, our colleague, um, and hope she's on the mend very soon. Um, I think Veronica has brought up some very important points. And in fact, uh, with the KR students, uh, my colleague Lisa Duncan and I will be interviewing KR students in the next few weeks for our next um, cohort to be coming through special collections. And as Veronica has pointed out, we cannot emphasize enough the, the excellent uh, work they've done um, and their commitment and, and contributions to special collections. Uh, the work that they do uh, on an ongoing basis has really, really helped us and we really wouldn't be able to function without them. This afternoon, um, I'm going to go ahead and present on our role of DISCHEC in Arizona, uh, University of Arizona Libraries and Special Collections. And before I do that, I just want people to be thinking about this slide. I pulled off the web, I pulled a couple of slides that I thought I'd share with everybody. But when we're talking about DISCHEC, and I'll go ahead and give you the definition of that in just a minute, is that I just want people to take a good look at this slide and really look at a number of these different things that you can see here. And, and of course, this afternoon, we're talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion. And with our first slide, really, what is uh, DISCHEC? It's really called the Diversity, Social Justice, and Equity Council of the University of Arizona Libraries. And I'm actually a, a member of that. I was appointed uh, just within this last year uh, to this uh, great organization. And it was founded in July of 2016 through a review process conducted by the University of Arizona Libraries Cabinet. And that is our senior administration, including our department heads uh, with staff, re staff representation. Um, and it was really a, a call to uh, the library to be more aware of this important factor um, uh, in, in our lives. And it, this slide really kind of reflects that, but in a number of different areas. And um, I, I think this is very important uh, for us, especially since we work in academic libraries, at least our situation uh, in, in academic libraries. So 10 members were selected to serve on the council from various departments throughout the organization, and two members served in ex officio. Um, in August 2016, the council began beating, uh, meeting bi-monthly uh, bi to develop a work plan and develop our scope. And so the scope really involves five key areas of inclusion and engagement activity. And this involves everybody from the student workers, graduate students, or KR students, if, if you've heard, you've heard uh, Veronica talk about, our classified staff and faculty librarians. And I'm not gonna read all of this, but really the key factors are involved in programming and learning, advisement and advocacy, outreach and engagement, uh, recognition and celebration, and assessment and reflection. And all of these areas here certainly involves special collections. And I'll go into a little bit more in just a few minutes on that. But if you think about these key five items, and this has been plugged into the strategic plan, um, this can involve special collections at a number of different levels, which wants me to pull up to this next slide here. You know, when I was looking at the, at the web to really find something to define DISCHEC in, in a sense in a shell, I really found these five uh, bubbles, if you will, surrounding equity. And the first is cultural humility. The second is transform uh, transformational organizing. The third is multicultural education, civic capacity and social justice, which I think really sums up a lot of the work that DISTEC does, but also more importantly, how it also affects and impacts special collections. The accomplishments to date for DISTEC involve an MOU with cabinet to formalize responsibilities of all parties in relation to this. So as Veronica has pointed out, this is happening at all levels. And this is really a critical thing to be thinking about as Veronica pointed out, is that this kind of work involves all levels, not just one level or one department, but everyone in, in all of the work that we do. It also involves integrating diversity, social justice and equity into the strategic map or strategic plan, as I pointed out establishing relationships and networking with campus partners, 
assessing diversity and inclusion measures at the University of Arizona Libraries, developing, promoting information resources regarding diversity and inclusion. Again, this involves special collections. And promoting and participating in diversity and inclusion events, such as webinars, workshops, potlucks, and other on-campus and community events. Many of these also involve panel discussions, highlighting and celebrating specific collections. Some of our, uh, the district current initiatives for 2021 involve Native American land acknowledgement, which is very important, anti-racism training, and trauma-informed care training. And these are really critical items too that many of you have already started to talk about. For us, it's critical because the land in which our University of Arizona sits on is land of the Tohono O'odham people. And it's very important that we are acknowledging this uh, in, in everything that we're doing, uh, particularly with uh, collections and outreach. Now, why is this so important to special collections? Obviously, it creates greater opportunities for impact to partner with other units, especially internally within the university library, as well as externally. Uh, we work with a lot of different organizations on campus and the greater Tucson community, and this involves reference, outreach, and instruction. Instruction is probably the most critical, particularly during the pandemic. Uh, we've had instruction and reference work ongoing virtually with our faculty and students. Um, thank goodness for the virtual world and, and being able to get the word out. Greater awareness and cultural humility. Collections development, as Veronica has touched upon, and implementing your Native American protocols and virtual brick and mortar exhibits and events, and much greater collaboration with our Black, Native American, Hispanic, Latinx, and LGBTQ communities, which we have very active communities here in, in, in the Tucson, Tucson area. In conclusion, Districts Creations enabled special collections to work more, very closely with a number of different programs and organizations within UAL and on campus. It's helped create a number of partnerships to assist us with acquiring new collections and documenting our community. And it's been an excellent opportunity for us to collaborate with district, that being special collections. And we hope you may consider developing a similar model at your own institution. Um, and again, our, our situation is very unique with this case study because we're an academic, uh, of course, in the university library system, but certainly could be tailored for state, local, uh, local historical society and local library program as well. So. This concludes my portion of the uh, presentation. So I, I think of, as Veronica has mentioned, we have plenty of time for Q&A. And so I don't know, Elena, did, did, uh, did you wanna put out a call for that or we have things in the chat box now? I can, I can stop sharing if you like. We have uh, one question or two, um, or if you'd like to continue a little bit more, you're welcome to as well. Um, or if we, do you want to start with the first question? Sure. Sure. Okay. Um, the first question is from Donna. She says, how would you define cultural comp competency for POC and for non-POC? Is it necessarily different? Should we create distinct guidelines? As a person of color, I myself had, I've had to work on my own cultural competency. I'll, I'll attempt at responding to that, but I think Steve uh, being a just check might also have a response. You know, um, just because we're PLC doesn't make us experts in cultural competence. Um, and we are all growing into that um, competency. There are um, publications that try to talk about levels of cultural competence. The, the book that I mentioned has a bit of explanation on that. But I think the main thing is to recognize that we're all growing into it and that we're not, um, we have, we don't, we're not experts. We learn as we go, but we do have to acknowledge some of those, some of that tacit knowledge that we do bring. Um, you know, the, the, the concept of cultural humility is, is the idea of putting yourself in, in the other's position. Um, so I think that, that goes a long way. Um, and I, one of the things that I didn't get to in my presentation is recognizing our limitations, um, both individually and at the institutional level. So, to, you know, talking about that a bit, doing assessment of that um, is important. Um, and I'm sure that with all the anti-racist actions that are going on, 
as our institutions are bringing in um, tra DEI training, take advantage of, of really looking at those areas where we're lacking or where we need to grow, both at the institutional level and at the individual level. Does that help, Donna? Yes. Thank you for the question. It's, a, it's an important one. Yeah. And then she has a follow-up question. Um, how do you evaluate whether a person is culturally competent when you hire them? That's a, that's, you know, um, that's a, I, I believe that's a really hard one. In fact, um, without saying too much, I've learned from a recent um, search um, you have to be very clear about your requirements and then just accept that that was a requirement and that is part of what you need, whether it's language or ability to work with others. Um, and so, you know, with your questions, I mean, that, that is part of the, the HR process is to help you develop questions that um, get to that piece. And don't, don't forget to put in questions re related to cultural competency. Um, your HR folks can help you with that. Remember that it's sort of getting at those, you know, like I said, those quote unquote soft skills, which I don't like to call them that because I think they're, I think they're actually hard skills to be honest. And we, we have another question uh, related to that. Um, do candidates, candidates meet with a DSJEC during an interview? Typically not, but I think that's a great idea. Uh, that's certainly something that I, I can bring to our district chair um, a, as a possibility. I, I thank you for the thank you for the question, a Amy. I'll, I'll say that in our search process, we do have questions that get to that. Um, we had. Um, meetings with stakeholders um, that you know, would work with communities um, as well. So that that gives us a sense of how individuals might work with the individuals that we work with at our communities. Great. Um, we don't have any questions presently. Did you want to touch on anything else? Um, if we don't have any questions, are you sure? Because, okay, I'll, I'll uh, <laughs> maybe it's the medicine that makes me want to talk, but <laughs> let me, let me pull something up. Okay. If, and then if, if other questions come up, fine, I'm, I'm, I'm happy not to, not to share any more um, slides, but let me see if I can, oops, oops, why am I, oh. Let me, let me just get to the very last slide, um, just because I want to get to the imperative of what we do in terms of collection development. Um, okay, and again, if questions come up, please. I hope you guys don't have any questions because it was disorganized on my end. Steve, I know did a great job. <laughs> um, I, I wanted to, to end with this. Um, so this quote comes from a, and you tell them, you tell them I was here, it comes from a, uh, an interview with uh, Luis Alberto Urrea that he did with Bill Moyers back in 2012. Um, and if you wanted to, get to it, because um, it's really moving to me and it's really uh, resonated with me in terms of the work that we do in terms of um, diversifying our collections um, and working with our collection development policies. Um, <clears throat> I was at a conference a while ago um, where I heard some discussion about localizing your research. And this also, uh, to me, relates to the issue of, or not the issue, but the the work of um, community archives. Um, so anyway, so I, I heard this 
discussion about localizing the research, you know, it was referring to um, this idea that journalists in that in that case, you know, in in, in some uh, you know they come to the border and then and then this is specific to the border, right? Because we're 90, 90 miles from the border here, and I grew up in the border, so I understand this idea of how how we're shown in the media. Um, so they come, they're you know um, their experience as journalists who who live by the border and report on the border versus what I call um, fly-by fly -by reporters, the difference between national understanding of a problem versus local knowledge of the nuanced histories and issues in your community. Um, in my case on the border, these kinds of source materials can provide a sense of the latter. And so I would have talked already about uh, different collections that we've um, brought in. Um, <clears throat> And this goes back to Donna's question about cultural competency. I mean, it's so nuanced just because you're Mexican as I am, doesn't mean that I have the understanding of all Mexican people, um, but, but you have to be open to understand that, that first of all, there's nuances. Um, so like I said, the quote here is by uh, Luis Alberto Rea, who's the author of many border books, including The Hummingbird Daughter, Hummingbird's Daughter, The Devil's Highway. Um, he, he, describes how he was at this place called uh, La Ladrillera, which means brickyard outside of Tecate, writing notes in his journal. And then this man comes up to him and asks, are you writing about this place? Are you writing about people, writing about me? To which he says, I probably am now. The man says, is anybody going to read this? I hope so. And then he's, the man says, he's, that's good. That's good, write about me. I was born in a garbage dump, spent my entire life picking trash. And when I die, they're going to bury me in the garbage. So you tell them I was here. And I really believe that this is what archives do. And <clears throat> another session I had, to, I, I had heard at the, this, this conference at a, about public history and how markers for certain communities are not present. It's the same with documentation. If it isn't present, how can we or researchers and historians tell them he was here. So our work is imperative in representation. So thank you, that's all I wanted to share. <laughs> Thanks Veronica. And we, we had another question uh, come up. Um, let's see. Let's see, okay. In your own experiences, how can we make sure that we keep growing our diversity and inclusion efforts and cultural competency. Is there a fear that institution, institutional leadership views or institution leadership views these types as programs as temporary? Yeah, I think this is why um, it's imperative that what we do, sorry, I keep using the word imperative now, but it is so important that what we do works within the frameworks that already exist within the, the infrastructures we already that already exist in your institution. Um, in my work, my approach has always been, let's do it within what is existing. So, you know, that includes making sure that funding is there for, uh, for work that we're doing um, that it's not a, a sort of a set aside allotted um, money um, or that we build a, you know, a separate um, building. Um, maybe that's important for some institutions, but, but for, for my approach, what becomes sustainable is what becomes part of the institution the way that it is. So I, I do believe that there is um, fear sometimes from people that, you know, it becomes this great thing now in the, in, in 1920, 1920, in 2020, um, you know, that we have anti-racist actions. And I believe those are important. I believe that there is certainly right now, I have hope that there's um, enough potency behind um, what's happened. If not, I don't know, I don't know what to tell you, but you know, that there is that um, engagement right now from the top to the bottom, from the side to side that I have hope that, that it isn't going to be a sort of, you know, temporary fix. 
Um, but for that reason, at least at our institution, we're starting with our leadership to do DEI um, training along with what GISTCHEC is already doing, which is what Steve um, um, uh, talked about. Um, but I think that if our, our leadership really has to be behind it, right? Because they're the managers of the funds, they're the managers of budgets, um, follow, the, follow your, your budget and you'll see your mission. So um, I think, I don't, I'm not sure if I answered the question. Does that help Emily? Yes, yes, she says it does. Okay. And- uh, oh, I guess I'm sharing, sorry. Uh, people had also wanted the, the BMO link and Tommy provided that, so that's great. Okay, thank you. And it's at uh, 16 minute and 40 seconds, that part of it anyway. Yeah. So he tells it much better, so please go to that, <laughs> to, go to that link. Uh, no, no more questions uh, presently. Okay. And we have about uh, nine minutes left, so. All right, everybody. Well, it was good to sort of see you even from <laughs> a virtual screen. I'm happy to stay until the time if you guys have questions that you wanna just ask me. Oh, Donna asks a question here about what are your steps to creating community engagement? Um, you know, Donna, I don't, I'm not sure that there are steps necessarily, but we've made it a deliberate effort in early on, um, we were asked to create a, a strategic plan for special collections. And that's when I was, I made sure that we hooked our strategic plan. This was like in 2000. 10, 12. Um, so I made sure that we in, hooked our, our strategic, uh, sorry, our strategic plan into the universities and to the libraries, which in that, um, at that time, and still it's true, you know, that there was an effort in focusing on the US-Mexico border. At that time, they called it Southwest, um, Southwest research, but I called it US-Mexico border <laughs> research. So, um, I think that doing those kinds of things, just making sure that you hook into what's existing and what is happening, um, or you know, almost compelling folks to to focus in the areas that you deem Im important given um, your situation. Um, so that to me, that was the biggest step, and then creating uh, partnerships with faculty on campus because they often were brokers um, to community members. Um, that was important. I met with, uh, you know, uh, your leadership, I guess, um, your BIPOC leadership in, in your institution is important because they'll know what kinds of um, collections haven't been brought into your institution that they think are important. So for me, what I learned from those initial meetings was that there were uh, several pioneers in bilingual education um, in the community that were elders and that we needed to um, start thinking about. And so from there, I worked with faculty partner, a faculty partner to help me meet with these individuals. And of course, this just doesn't happen overnight. These are, you know, years of work. Um, but that was one of the ways that we brought in some significant work by um, um, bilingual ed, ed, ed pioneers in, in the Tucson area. Um, so, you know, it's not steps, but you make deliberate moves, I guess. I, I, does that help, Donna? Just, and I don't know, at, th at this point, maybe we can unmute people since it's a small group and we're at five minutes.
Thank you, Veronica, that, that was helpful. Okay. Thank you for the question. All right. Thanks, Elena, for doing yeah, the moderating. So I guess I guess it's about all the um, questions. Um, so please join me for a virtual round of applause for Veronica and Steve. Um, it was an excellent presentation, and we truly appreciated hearing from them. Uh, coming on our schedule is the break with the vendors at uh, two o'clock your time or three o'clock central time. Um, okay. See you then. Thank you everyone. Bye.